Inspired by the lyrics of the Prince song When Doves Cry, Maybe I'm Just Like My Father is an audio series that will explore the relationships between artists, their fathers, their children and the effects it has on their creative outputs. We aim to be telling the human, humorous and heartbreaking stories of dads from a wide range of backgrounds and creative disciplines. This can include musicians, filmmakers, rappers, songwriters, visual artists and DJs. We're going deep into the personal battles of loneliness, social isolation and mental health. Everything from single parenthood, adoption, autism and addiction amongst many more. I think there's an island disc if it was made for dads by dads, sharing stories that never normally get told. And now we begin our exciting adventure of Maybe I'm just like my father. What's that coming over the hill? Hello, what's the song? Don't you know? We're talking about a revolution. We are here. father was famous. He was the greatest samurai in the empire. Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Maybe I'm Just Like My Father. We've got a very special guest with us today. He's a stand-up comedian, a writer, a broadcaster, a podcast host, um, an author, a father of one, and most importantly, apart from all of that, he was a recent guest on the Dada Soul Sessions where he gave a, apart from just giving a very killer routine to gags, he opened up about being a dad. Kevin Day, good evening. Hello there. Thank you for that introduction. It makes me sound a lot more important than I often feel. You are greatly important. Um, I'll tell you <laughs> what did really strike me when we spoke a couple of weeks ago at the event. I know we were just basically, for those that haven't been to a dad's old session, it's an online evening for dads just to have a little bit of a chat, get some stuff on the chest, maybe watch you know, a wonderful guest like Kevin do a turn. But... We started to actually drift rather than the after the comedy. We started to drift into some pretty deep conversation. You said you didn't normally have those sort of conversations with your pals, and these could be fellas that you've known for years. Hmm. So was it? It was obviously a strange one for you. It was because it kind of. I wouldn't say it crept up on me. I, I expected that I would be asked questions afterwards I I thought some of them might be about football and might be about comedy but it as it turned out it was quite an intimate sort of gathering um and I think as well because this is an odd thing to say but it you know we're still in lockdown I'm a I'm a comedian first and foremost I always describe myself as a comedian so I'm a natural show off and I haven't had many opportunities to show off during the pandemic and no live gigs obviously so just the fact that I'd done 15 minutes of comedy to people even though the the response was via emojis rather than people actually laughing I, I was quite I was sort of quite full of adrenaline in a way so I think that kind of helped but it's just as, as I said I think all dads will kind of recognize this we'll, I will talk to, to my mates my close mates about all sorts of things you know the you know, politics emotions but I, I can't remember many conversations I've had with them about about being a dad you 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 don't tend to do it. I mean, you might, if there are issues with with one of their kids or if there are problems at school, that might sort of come up. But but the actual emotions of being a dad, it's not something that comes out. I think most dads would sort of talk to their partners first or their own dads if they're still with them or, or a counsellor rather than talk to your friends because you, you kind of, it's almost, it's a terrible male thing, isn't it? It's almost a sign of weakness, a sign of a, a, a failure that you're saying to them, look, has anyone else had this experience? And that's all that, it's almost what you're doing it for. It's the thing I think that struck a chord, I know with a lot of people doing your thing a couple of weeks ago, as I had tweets from, was, was when I mentioned about when my son was born, when I was expecting hallelujahs, choirs of angels, I was expecting my whole life to suddenly change and it, it, it didn't. And, and I felt, you know, obviously I was delighted, I was over the moon, but I, I felt awful for years that I wasn't more, you know, that my life didn't change in that split second, that I didn't promise to change ever. And, and it turns out, talking to a lot of other dads, that that's quite a common thing. And we've all felt terrible for years, terrible, but guilty about, you know, not suddenly being flooded by light and hearing angel voices to tell us to behave. And then if, if, I'd, if I'd asked, a mate who had kids before because I was like the last one in my group to have kids if I'd said to one of them did that, did that happen to you and they all said yes it did then I would have been much happier for years but it's just 
it's not a natural thing, and we will. And, and we, you know, the friends I have, I've got lots of different groups of friends through, through various aspects, but the friends I have, I'm closer to. We will, we will talk about emotions. We'll talk about being upset. You know, if if our relationships are struggling, we would, we would talk about that quite happily, and we'll talk about politics, and we'll talk about some quite deep stuff. But being a dad, I don't recall many conversations, except when your kids are like now. We would sort of take the piss out of each other. You know, when the kids became teenagers and were terrible, cliched teenagers we might joke yeah. about that do you know what i mean but we would never we would never sort of discuss things because i mean i was lucky because my my lad was never a complete cliche as a teenager he was always a, a, a dick yeah but it was there's always the not getting out of bed and the getting into trouble with girls type thing but and we would take the piss out of each other about that but never never spoke about what it's like being a being a dad it's it's, it's, it's that a strange is weird, thing isn't it? It, it yeah. is, and I, and I think it's not uncommon. That's the thing, and, and like I say, we we yeah, we're not we are sort of typical blokes in a way, but we're not typical blokes who who won't ever talk about emotions, who will who will only ever talk about football. We're not we're not like that. We're happier only talking about football. But if if things happen, then we will talk about them. But it's just I, I, the more I've spoken, oddly, I've spoken more to people since doing that dadless whole thing about that experience and about talking to dads. And I think it, what really helped was the fact that I didn't know anybody that I was talking to, that these people were asking me questions. And I didn't, I didn't know. I couldn't see them. I didn't know what they looked like. It turns out a couple of them listen to my podcast and have seen me perform comedy, which is fine. But I don't know them. And it, it's, 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 it's odd, isn't it? How it's it almost a became kind like of counseling. therapy, isn't it? it yeah, well, you, do you know what? It almost be, I've always resisted. And at any stage in my life, I've always been a firm believer in self-counselling. That's where I become a bloke. It's like when my mum died, I didn't need counselling. As I'm a bloke, I can self-count. I, yeah, that's my, I'm an articulate, intelligent man. I can self-counsel. I don't need it. But that, that evening with you a couple of weeks ago, it's probably the closest thing to therapy I've had in that I, I was able to, to share, I mean, nothing private, but I was able to share emotions and share thoughts that I hadn't done with, with anybody, oddly enough. And that... I, and I, I didn't, for a minute, as I told Ali, my wife, about it afterwards, and she was pleased, and but quite intrigued. And she said, well, did you, you did you regret saying anything? Did you talk about Ed personal stuff? I said, no, I didn't talk about any personal stuff about Ed. And I, I didn't regret anything I said. I said, if anything, I'm really pleased to have got it, to have finally got it off my chest. And, and I, I kind of wish there was some things I'd got off my chest, you know, when, you know, 20 years ago, rather than when my son's a full grown adult. Wow. That that that's that's a hell of a um, a reference point, isn't it? It's but this is what I, I think. There's a line I use. You know, if I, if I walked into a pub, and you know, went over to a load of middle aged men, hello, you tell about your feelings. They go, no, don't be ridiculous. I'm absolutely fine. Go away. But if we put them in the same space, then suddenly it opens up. You give them a ticket, and me, me, me. I think it, I think the fact that everyone on in the dadless whole thing. Is, is there for you so you know i mean i use the phrase you you know it's a safe space you know that people are there because they have or they need support or they want uh like-minded people around them so you kind of that's a sort of shortcut so you, yeah. you don't have to explain anything before and you don't have to say this is my problem you're just talking to dads who are coming to terms with being a dad and it's not something you it uh, you know the, the antenatal classes were really I still talk about them now because basically all they told the blokes in the antenatal classes was where to park in the hospital. There was no, none of it was sort of directed at us. And that, and ever since, there's no, there's all sorts of you know, useless books about childhood and about having babies, which until you have a child, as my wife said, none of the, none of the books in the world can help until you've got, you had your own child. So you might as well not read them because you know, everybody's experience is different. But there's there's very little there's very little aimed at at dads to be. There's very little saying. Look, this is how your life is going to change. And I always say to them, when when young people when young friends of mine say we're having a baby, I always say, brilliant, your life is going to completely change. And they say, no, don't say that. And I say, no, it is, but in a good way. You're like because, but no one said that to me. You you kind of think, well, of course my life's going to change. I've got a baby now, but no one explains to you how. Even if they did. You, you wouldn't be able to comprehend. You know, I read the blogs and did the books and stuff. You know, my, my lad's a, a lot younger than uh, yours. He's nine. Yeah. But there's nothing that actually resonated to me. That's why I started writing my own one. Yeah. Because it just didn't exist. I wanted to take the piss and talk about why the Stone Roses are the best band ever. <laughs> yeah. And then go, you know, 
you know, at three o'clock in the, or three in the morning when my son was teething and he was crying out, I couldn't soothe him. All he wanted was his mum. I yeah. felt like a massive failure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's nothing, you know, when you know, Ed was breastfed, so for a year I mostly saw the back of his head and there's nothing, there's not a lot you can do in, in the first year. How did make that yourself... make you feel? I, I... That's an interesting one because it 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 made it constantly made me feel uh, I wanted time to pass, which is an odd thing to say. I want I was I was always looking forward to that moment when I joined in, if you want, in, for want of a better word. There's never there's not a hint of resentment. I love the bones of him then as I do now. But uh, Ali and Ali was brilliant as well because Ali we we would have Ed in bed with us for the first year and Ali was brilliant because she'd wake up to feed. And she said, "Well, there's no point you being awake to feed as well. It's not, it's not doing anything for me. You, you sleep as much. You know, so I was kind of sleeping. I was on tour a lot of the time, or working. So I worried that I was missing out on bonding. But as it happened, that wasn't the case. But do you know it's interesting that the lack of information before. And I, I was last week um, when England played Scotland. There were three games in a row. A, a, a group of us safely, if Matt Hancock's." listening he won't be anymore obviously but <laughs> it's, it's heavy jabby's listening but so there was eight of us around my mate's house and we were yeah so but we got funny enough we got talking and the subject of this came up and and for the first time i talked to a mate of mine who's got three grown-up girls and we talked about how parenting is different when you're the father of boys and when, when it then the father of girls and there's all sorts of different issues that arise if you're the father of a girl and if you're a father of the boy but no one no one ever said that to us in antenatal classes. No one ever said, look, psychologically, it might be difficult for you when you when your girls grow up and become, you know, young women and and want to experiment with with men or girls or whatever it is. No one ever talked about that. So it, that, yeah, you know, my mate was was he he had a terrible time with all three girls. And they loved the loveliest girls you could meet, but he 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 had he was jealous of them growing up and wanting to go out with other boys. So. And, and you kind of go, well, maybe your common sense should prepare you for that, but it, it clearly, it clearly didn't. So that, that coming back to that first year, though, I never felt, I never felt excluded. I just, I just kind of wished there was things I could do. So I mean, I helped. You know, I, you never saw a man go down the shops quicker. I, I became the the best nappy buyer in the in South London. You know what I mean? Cause but were you changing them as well, Kevin? Oh yeah, yeah. I tried. Well. <laughs> I did. Oh no, I tried to. I mean, that's the other thing with my dad as well. As my dad was around a lot. As my mum was away at the time, she was looking at. She was in Ireland, looking after both her parents. Because even though she's got nine brothers and sisters, for some reason it was her that had to look after them when they were dying. So my dad was living with us when Ed was a when Ed was a baby, and he 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 loved doing. He he would volunteer to change nappies, and he he would spend when Ed was. You know, he'd be fed and he'd be put in his little pajamas, and he'd be lying on his back playing with his mobile. My dad would be just lying next to him, staring at him, and he would change nappies. And he would, he would later on when he needed feeding, he would do that because he was doing all the things that he wasn't able to do when when I was a baby. He yeah, he wasn't. Um, he, 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 blokes he, wouldn't push brams in public and no, he wouldn't. stuff he, like that. Well, he, he said as well at the time he wouldn't want to. He wouldn't. It, it wasn't like I wanted to push your pram or I wanted to change your nappy. It was just. And the reason he didn't want to is because he had never been told it was an option, and he 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 thought it was a woman's job. And it's the same when I was born; I was several days overdue. So basically, he was in the pub for most of that time, and every half hour he'd go to the phone box and and check whether he had a baby, and then come back. And then after the fourth day, he came back, bought a round of drinks, which he's never done again. And then that's how they, that's how they knew he had a ba he had a baby boy. But it's funny. So no, I didn't. I I. I, I I helped and I changed nappies and all that, but and I I didn't feel that I was less of a parent because I wasn't able to to feed, but I was aware as you were that if you know for the first year two years of their life, babies have very much got a favourite parent and it tends to be the mother for, for obvious reasons, you know. But I was I mean, you know I was I, well see I was also I was just I was just pleased because Ali uh, Ali wanted to breastfeed, but she she's 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 always hated the national the national you know NCT. The, the, breastfeeding Nazis. She always wanted to breastfeed, but she was quite plain that if it was going to cause problems or hurt, she would happily feed feed Ed by bottle. So, But she was really pleased that she could breastfeed, and it's like I was really pleased that Ed was, was getting natural feeding. But, uh, yeah, I, I didn't... Uh, yeah, I, I knew there would come a time when my my parenting skills would kick in, if you like, when 
when I would start to be funny dad, do you know what I mean, which is what I was looking forward to most. So no, it was, there was probably a little bit of jealousy looking back on it, to be perfectly honest. But no, I mean, because I, I, I was never kept away from from him. I was never kept out of the process. It's just you're not part, physically not part of the process. And that's that's how things are naturally. If, if Ed had been bottle fed, then I would have happily taken my turn to, to do it. But as it happened, I, I was the one who carried on being bottle fed on wine for the next the next year or so. So it's perfectly happy. You know, so I, I I always used to I just used to envy. He used to have this look when he finished breastfeeding. He would sort of fall off the breast with this most satisfied look on his face, which I always kind of envied a little bit. Was he uh, smug? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. He looked it. He looked it basically. <laughs> It was, it was, it was, every now and again, I used to think he's looking at me like you're never going to touch these again. These are these are these are. It's out of your control, son. Isn't it's it? basically yeah. it's what it's like. But no, I didn't. It's a it's a strange one. But I I, I really understand what you mean when you know with because it's. I tell the only interesting thing I took from the antenatal class was from a child psychologist who I got chatting to afterwards, um, hmm. and I and I was I said my one I said I've always had this thing my one thing I hate. I hate hearing babies cry because I feel sorry for the baby. I always, I, I, even when I was a kid, I didn't like hearing babies cry. Not because it annoyed me, but because I always thought, oh, the poor baby. And, and this child psychologist said that babies, uh, you know, e even up to the age of three, a baby won't cry to annoy somebody. If, if the baby cries, it's hungry or it's not well or it wants changing. And if you rectify all those things, it won't, it won't cry. So that was the thing I took away most uh and so and and for the most part he was a happy little he was a happy little baby he still is a for the most part a happy little chap so no i, well, I understand what he's saying but um I, I did i always knew that my 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 sort of time would kick in once he was a, a toddler basically so go back to something you mentioned a little while you were out obviously gigging yeah so how old were you when you became a dad and where were you in your career because i imagine hanging around service stations in the middle of the night traveling the country doing stand-up spots doesn't really work as a dad i was quite a late dad actually i was 33 before we had ed okay um by which time my sort of intense touring days were coming to an end anyway um and i was i, I tended to do i was doing bigger gigs in bigger theaters but not not night after night i'd, I'd kind of I'd, I'd grown out of the, I sort of, I, I hit this strange halfway phase where I was, I was kind of too big for the circuit. I was too big for the, you know, going around 30, 40 people in nightclubs, but I wasn't big enough yeah. to sell out, you know, the Apollo, like Vanilla Newman were doing. So I sort of, I was doing two, 300 seat with the Andalusia Art Centres and they tended to be one gig a week and I'd be doing some TV work and, and I was doing a radio series at the time when Ed was born, I was doing a lot of radio work. So... I was doing worse, but I wasn't sort of constantly touring the way I would have been five years earlier. And I, I know a lot of comics, I'm ashamed to say, perfectly, they can't wait to get back out on tour. So they don't have to be a proper dad in the in the first in the first year. Um, but so, no, I, I wasn't I, I, I was I think the longest I was I was away for about eight, eight days once. Um, so I'd be away a couple of nights a week, probably. But I, I, I used Ed as an excuse to get back home from stuff as quickly as possible because I generally what, like, like a social get out clause. A, a little bit, yeah. I mean, it was it was strange. That took a bit of getting used to because you know that's the other problem because we you know I still can't. There's no point in me going to bed before half twelve, one o'clock now because I won't be able to go to sleep, which is a hang up from what I do for a living. Because you you know you come off stage at ten o'clock, eleven o'clock at night, you're full of adrenaline. You have a drink. You go somewhere with with the other comics. You're talking bollocks about comedy for a long time, and that, that so the hours were still on. So, but I would, to my shame, I'd, I I would use it as an excuse to leave work, get gigs early. I'd try and get on, you know, early. Or I'd get I'd schedule gigs a bit early. But you know, if there was an after show party, I wouldn't necessarily leave that early to come home for it. But um, I, I it, it just comes a time when you think, oh, do you know what? I'd rather be at home looking at my wife and my baby than talking the same bollocks that I'd spoke last night. And yeah, and it's and it's like he started coming up to Edinburgh with us from a very early age. I think he was um, he was about nine months. Uh, we took him to the first Edinburgh after he was born. So he was born in November. So Edinburgh was the following August. And it's like I've got um, I, I had to stop. That's I'm, the one good thing about being a comedian is when you actually cross about something, you can turn it into comedy. 
So I was actually furious. I'd be pushing Ed around all these places in, in his push chair and he'd be getting all the fucking attention. Which is which is not how it's meant to be. Yeah, you know I mean I'm a stand up comedian, I want the attention. I don't want there's all these Oh well, yeah, I'm these, on the telly box, don't you? Yeah, know, basically on. basically, yeah, there's all these people I knew, all these comedians and and fans. And I remember one gig I did, it was a brilliant gig, it was one of my best uh, Edinburgh Edinburgh shows that year. I was coming out. I was coming out off stage and coming out of the venue, and there's nearly always a you know four or five more people wanted to chat and the autograph, and they're all gathered around my son in his pushchair, going, "What, what a cute little baby he is!" Basically, so uh, so that's so, so, so we taste for comedy. Uh, sorry, I was going to say taste for comedy because he's a stand up now, isn't I don't, he? I don't so think do you think it, you warped him at an early age? I don't think. I don't think it's a strange one. I think because we made the decision very early on that obviously life would change, but that we would include Ed in our life right so for example we we didn't stop going to restaurants we just took ed with us basically as a, as a baby we didn't stop going for day trips or we just took ed with us so we just became a, a, a threesome rather than a couple but i mean he from a very early age he was he was on stage from a very early i mean he, he was he did a video with joe brand when he was two years old uh this reading uh thing so he's kind of he's always been around it but I've, uh, oddly enough he didn't he, he was in a choir when he was a, a young boy at this south london choir called libera uh who were very well known and traveled the world and he he decided he wanted to leave that at the age of 12 and then he he, he didn't seem at all interested in in going on stage in any shape or form whatsoever and then he he came home one night and said, Mum and Dad, I've got something to tell you. I've just done a gig, which is like, oh, OK, right, fine. But no, I don't think I don't think it was um, shaped by being pushed around the uh, Pleasant's Courtyard in a pushchair when he was two years old. <laughs> well, you don't know until he seeks the psychologist. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, well, yeah until, you, until you get him as a guest on this in a couple of years' time, you won't know. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can just about Grandad, Kev. OK, mm. uh, what we're going to do, um, strange question, what we like to sort of understand is a little bit more about you and what we do with Dadless Soul your music is a large part of yeah. that so is there a sort of a song or an anthem that you have I know it's very hard to maybe pick one but something that, that kind of sums you up or is your, your favourite number if that's maybe easier to understand that's that's much easier to understand I think do you know what it's, it's I, I th that's an almost impossible question to answer I think because each, I think every time, if you ask me what my favourite song is, I'll probably give you a different answer in half an hour's time because it's it sort of changes on a daily basis. It changes, absolutely, yeah. It changes as to what sort of mood you're in. I mean, there's a couple of pieces of of, of classical music. There's one called Grieg Wedding Day at Trondheim, which, if I'm sad, I'll play it, and if I'm happy, I'll play it. And it, but there's 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 one song for me that sort of transcends everything, which was. Um, Love will tear us apart. Joy division, probably my my happiest four minutes uh, as a performer was in Edinburgh, where Peter Hook, the bass player of Joy Division, was was uh, married to Carolina Hearn, God rest her soul, uh, Mrs. Merton. Um, so he came to Edinburgh one year, and he really enjoyed it because he said he said basically his theory was that rock music had gone soft in the past couple of years, and everyone was drinking mint tea and becoming a vegan and comedians were like the like rock music was when he started so but he ended up there's this gig called late and live with bill bailey's band playing i ended up singing love will tear us apart at this gig with peter hook playing the bass which was um, <laughs> which was brilliant and he he said to me he said to me afterwards because we we wrote the words down and he, it's one of the saddest and the happiest moments of my life because we we sang it and of course he brought the house down and then said to me afterwards he said fucking hell he said that's the first time i've read the words properly i i, I didn't realize how miserable he was which is um it's a strange thing but i mean that was that was probably the high most it, it's really odd most most actors are frustrated comedians and most comedians are frustrated rock stars in my experience so actually singing love will tear us apart love will tear us apart is a song i go back to uh joy division i love joy division it's one of the reasons as a as a it's it's odd my mates constantly bemused by the fact that I don't hate Man United as much as a normal civilised person should do. It's like I don't I you know, I don't I don't like them, but yeah. I don't hate them. It's partly because two of my most favourite bands are from Manchester, the Smiths and Joy Division. And my all time my all time idol, George Best, is my all time hero who played for Man United. So I can't really hate them. I, I love Manchester as a town, but Joy Division are a band I constantly go back to and Love Will Tear Us Apart 
is the is the one song that I constantly go back to. I, I think if there's it 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 sort of I first heard it at a time when I was really discovering. This sounds wanky, doesn't it? But I was really discovering. Yeah. Well, did you just say yes and agree with me that it sounded wanky? I it? did say it's wanky. What I was going to say is, <laughs> we, we'll have a quick listen to it oh, now. Sure, of course. Before we played that beautiful song, Kevin, I rudely interrupted you and you were going to tell us the why behind Love Will Tell Us Apart for you. It, it's just, it's, it's, like it's, it's, a, it's a cliche, but I, I grew up in, the, in a part of South London where you, you can't, unless you live there, you can't describe it. It's got a name now, it's called Graveney, which it's called the Graveney Triangle, totally made up by estate agents. When I was a kid, it was called Up the Road. That's what it was called. It was like there's no name yeah. for it. It, it. It's sort of where Streatham meets Tooting meets Mitcham. There's nothing. There's nothing there to identify. So you know, all my is that big South London sort of Irish community? Yeah, there? very much so. Yeah. yeah. Although my dad was English, you'll find out. But it was very much so. Tooting, especially, we were part of the sort of South London Irish community, which is an issue for another pod because it. it I've, I've got ongoing issues with identity, and I certainly had growing up, but. It's it's until the age of four. I think the experience for most youngsters is is the same. Certainly in 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 those days, you're kind of there's nothing you can hang on to. So football became my big my big identity. Like, uh, Palace, Crystal Palace became my big identity. But that's that, and, and even now I'm still 
I'm still very proud when people say to me, oh, yeah, you're, you're a Palace fan. That really cheers me up. It makes uh, t The fact that I'm identified with a particular football club really cheers me up. So I love London. I'm, I'm passionate about London. I'm obsessed with London and, and London history. And, and, you know, I'm only half But London joking. isn't London anymore to start. Well, what is, what it, 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 it's, it's not. I know you're quite right. But I'm, I've, I'm only half joking when I say if I could put a moat around the M25 and make London an independent state, I would happily do it. But it's only... It's only I was, when I was growing around the age of sort of 16, 17, you suddenly start to to come into yourself and you suddenly start. I was always a very imaginative kid. I mean, it used to drive my mum up the wall. She wanted me to be out climbing trees and fighting, basically. And I just wanted to read. Yeah. So I told, and the reason why is because of my dad. So I was always had a very, very vivid imagination. But sort of 15, 16, you just start to discover the world and you discover girls and you start to go to away games and you're starting to, to think. What sort of year that, was that? This would have been, well, I was born in 1961, so I'm much younger than I look. So this was sort of yeah. mid-70s. Mid um, okay. I, and I got my first Saturday job, so I had a bit of money. And, and f suddenly music became almost as important as football. And on, on you, so you go to football on a Saturday, and then just about every other night of the week, you'd start going to music. And in those days, everywhere, you know, Tooting had, had two music pubs. You know, we had the UK subs old punk band we were tooting band there's a band called the vip so you'd go and see them and then you'd go to uh the 101 club at clapham junction and you'd go and see slightly bigger bands and then you'd go to the greyhound fulham palace road and see even bigger bands or you'd go to hammersmith palais and see proper big bands so but there was always somewhere to go and see music and music became really really important and and it's it's around in you know the way my my and and I just remember hearing Joy Division for the first time and just going, that's that's how I feel. That's that's exactly it. That's that's you know, and it's 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 for a different pod to explain exactly how that was, but it just suddenly you people would say to me, What do you think about life? And you'd go, This Joy Division, that that you know, and then you you almost like supporting a football team, the bands that you started to love and follow then, they stay with you for the rest of your life. And it's like I remember yeah, with, there, there was a couple of other bands from Tooting. There's one called Blue Zoo, and these bands, the VIPs. When they were on Radio One, it's like it's the most exciting thing you've ever heard. Like because you knew them, you know what I mean. And and it's, it was just so that became part of my music, became part of the identity as well. And and Love Will Tear Us Apart became the song that just most associated that you know that period. And that you never forget that sort of three year period. And I started going out with my first girlfriend for the first time and I went to university and got thrown out of university for the first time and, and all these, you know, because I went, because I, I, my girlfriend was ill, I took a year off and went to university at the age of 19. I, I went to Reading University to study archaeology and I, I thought, I, you know, 19, I thought I was a grown up man. You know, I, was, I didn't want to go back to school as I saw it. And I really got the hump because I didn't get a trowel on my first day of studying archaeology. And I've, I've, I fell in love with this mature student. And I was, basically, I didn't go to any lectures, and I ended up being thrown out. And I became a builder. And ironically, I got a trowel on my first day as being a builder. So I was going to say that's from a you know uh, a working class South London boy. Even going to university was quite a step, wasn't it? Was that part of your you know were a lot of your pals doing that, or were they all going into trades and doing normal it, jobs? It was never part of the plan. I went to. Because I was quite clever, I went. I got a place in um, local Catholic grammar school uh, called Salesian College, which uh, my primary school was the, the most wonderful experience. It was a wonderful, warm, nurturing environment. Now, the, the headmaster there, Mr. Collins, he was the father of Pauline Collins, the actress. Um, okay. He was the most wonderful character who who didn't who believed that coming from South London uh, and being working class didn't stop you being able to do anything. He believed, which was unusual, that girls were the equal of boys. He was, and and one of the reasons He's I quite still a radical like, thinker for the time. Well, he, he he was. I mean, he looked he looked like Mister Pickwick, basically. Is that sort of? But and I still one of the reasons I still love Christmas is that one day in December he just came round to class and said, "No, no lessons today. We're going to watch a film in the hall." And I'm not that long ago, three or four years ago, I was at the theatre and I saw Pauline Collins and I thought I'm going to have to say something to her. And I I, I went up to her. And this is going to sound, I said, I'm sorry, Miss, Paul, you don't know who I am. And as it turned out, she did. So I was really chuffed about that. All right. So obviously I had to drop that fact in. But I said, Look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I, I which it, stand up comedian ego. You have to, you have to feed it yourself sometimes, Dan, if you're not going to do it for me. <laughs> but I said, to, I said, I said, Paul, Miss Collins, I said, I'm sorry, you don't know me, but I'm just, I just have to say what, 
what a wonderful, inspiring man your your father was and still is to me. And she said, not a week goes by without a stranger coming up to saying the same thing, which is brilliant. But oh, wow. I went, I know, but I went from that environment to a, a Catholic grammar school, which thought it was a public school. Basically, it was uh, whatever the opposite of nurturing is. It was the opposite of nurturing, and basically. They were only really interested in in the cleverest of kids, and I was never the cleverest of kids, but I was always bright, and I I I liked I quite liked learning, not science. I never understood science. I still don't. But uh, I ended up going. I think there was probably uh, I think probably out of my year out of ninety, I think probably twenty went on to either university or or poly, and others went into you know sort of half decent jobs maybe it might have been more than that but the only reason i went to university is because i had no idea what else i could do to be and perfectly it was free honest. at the time and it was and it was absolutely free exactly so and all but there was a big issue because i was the first with my extended irish family i've got 72 first cousins on my mum's side and i was the first they've been busy haven't they yes yeah well this one day we will outnumber the protestants and then that's the only way we get the whole <laughs> island back basically that's i think that's their thinking to be perfectly honest <laughs> But, um, There's not a lot of telly going on. I know, exactly. But um, I was the first one in the in the family to go to university, which was obviously a source of great joy to my mum, and then a source mm. of great shame to her when I was the first one to be thrown out as well. So I'm not entirely sure how he ended. Oh yes, but anyway, first uh, first girl, whatever, first girl. But and then, so that mu so that mu but but I was a proper, as they used to call it, indie shoegazer. That sort of music was what appealed to me, and 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 still does. So that that song kind of represents that the biggest period of change in my life essentially basis and then and then within a year i was working in the ambulance service and and i rose to a fairly senior management position there so so that love will tell is that when you left the of, glamorous world of hr yes it was yeah yeah so that's how did that, you do that to turn to comedy because hr i imagine it's very you know full of stars and oh, you know God. late night parties why on earth would you want to there were a couple of late nights some of those training courses could get a bit fruity but um Ooh. Um, I, I left it because I fell in love with comedy. I, I, do you know what? I, I turned sixty this year, and part of me wished I'd stayed in HR because I would have been. I wouldn't be talking to you now. I'd be. I'd be in my villa in Spain. With yeah, the pension. charming. But, um, thank you. No, that's sorry. Yeah. Well, just, you would You you wouldn't want me talking to you, Dan, either, would you? Here's the here's a here's a dad from HR. Um, I I, I went. To, uh, yeah. Sorry. No. The only reason I left at HR, I, I fell in love with comedy. I. I I, I, it's a long story which we will save for a different pod but I, I, mm. I started to do open spots I, I, I fell in love with it and and after uh, for two years I was doing both jobs and then uh, yeah I was I was having to I was turning up an hour late for work and having to tell people off who turned up half an hour late for work basically so and then I got offered I got asked to go to Edinburgh one year and I'd already used my annual leave so I thought well this is the time to make a decision my mum never forgave me to be perfectly honest but um, but that, but Love Will Tear Us Apart kind of covered that, you know, last year at school. Period. Uh, yeah, and then working for a year and then going to university. It covered that era where you sort of, you, those are the, the two or three years where you sort of, the, the clay is modelled into the adult in, in a sense. And so that song was, was, was always been there, which is, it's a lot, it's a very long way, way round of saying I really like that song, basically. <laughs> it is a very beautiful song. Um, yeah. I've got a side question for you, right? Mm. Okay. So before you're somebody's father, you were somebody's fun. So yeah. this is all, let's paraphrase Ray Winston a little bit and going, who's your daddy? You know, where, who's the man that made you the man? You know, what sort of, um, or what, your, your dad's still with us, isn't he? He's still with us. He's um, 87, which is uh, infuriating him. Um, he's he only lives he lives at one end of Stratham. I live at the other, so I see him every second day. Um, he's he's physically very fit. He's mentally very fit. Um, is he still but, independent? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's, he's, like he's very he's very independent. He has he he has issues associated with being eighty seven, which you can't say that to him because it really aggravates him. He's still we lost mum, God rest her soul, six years ago. He's still. He still can't understand when when it, you know he'll be down in the dumps, and I say well, it could be part of the grieving process. Dad, you never know. And also, he's got women. He's got women trouble at the moment, which is driving everybody <laughs> up the fuck. It's just really. I, I can't. That's what you want at eighty seven. I, I can't have there's, woman there's, trouble. There's a WhatsApp group in the street, which is basically women of a certain age who look after him and keep an eye on him, and he's he's always been a terrible flirt, which my mum never minded right. because my mum never minded because a 
she w she went to her death believing that my dad was irresistible to women, so she never blamed any woman for talking to my dad. Oh, and also, that's kind of beautiful, wasn't it? I, I know, and and she 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 knew that if any of these women took him up on it, he'd run a mile. So she always he, so she was very <laughs> secure, and, and, and which is odd. And you know, the, the, the beautiful thing on her on her head on her headstone, on her gravestone, he 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 didn't want names dates he and, and so what is carved on a on a headstone is is on is a name and the the words the most beautiful girl in the world which is like because that's what he well, wants that's right in the fields isn't it i Ooh. know i know and it's uh it's still every time i go and see her it it, it still <laughs> punches me in the stomach do you know what i mean but he's a yeah he's still care everyone every, everyone all my mates adore him he's still he, he still can. He's just had all these adventures that I never knew about when I was growing up. He didn't. He waited till Mum was dead before he started telling me all these stories. He was. He's. He's a proper. It, it was always an issue because she was from a massive Irish Catholic family, and he was a. He's from a South London family. Religion wasn't. He didn't even know what religion he was because it wasn't. Just yeah. wasn't an issue. Do you know what I mean? But he was. So on my Mum's side, it's all. It's all Irish, and it's very rural. Very poverty's not. It's the only word you can use to describe it. My dad's side is his mum's family were all um, uh, used to sell. They were all costers basically in Covent Garden. His his, his granddad was a, a proper old fashioned tinker, sold pots and pans. And on his is dad's side, of fruit and veg for those. Yeah, fruit and veg, but yeah, also a, they yeah. they used to sell. Um, there's a there's a book, a, a history of London book. that has got a picture of my great grand. She used to sell uh, woolly lambs to blokes coming out of the opera in covent garden so it's a it's a without standing all Hold on, sorry because just lambs yeah little as tiny in bar, bar. Like, as in bar lambs yeah little toy lambs that they would sell to blokes coming out of the opera and and, and the bloke would, would be forced well, yeah, my great grand would force this bloke to buy a lamb because obviously if he didn't he didn't love the woman he was with sort of thing so it's um so my what, family, a knitted lamb or a real yeah, little, lamb no a little knitted lamb little that they made oh right good that's, i thought you meant lamb. a real one i thought no oh, no not even my I, I, I come to the opera take home you yeah, know yeah. chops i wouldn't put it past some members of my family to sell lamb outside an opera but um so without without sounding prolier than now but it's, it's working class on all sides but we you know we never I, my dad was still he was a fire alarm engineer he still got his money through the post he got cash through the post on a thursday the registered envelope would turn up with his cash and the money would run out on wednesday night and if if the postman was late on a thursday morning he had to wait for the postman or he couldn't afford to get to work so but we never had holidays but we never we were never short of anything we never you know we never went short of meals there were a couple of times i remember the odd debt collector knocking the door but it was no i went i lacked for nothing but my dad was was fantastic i was an only child and my mum shouldn't have had children uh, she was warned not to have children because she had issues and I, like I say I was very late and she she suffered from depression um, and then when she had me she had terrible terrible postnatal depression which turned into clinical depression which she had uh, and I know twice my dad had to fight social services away from the front doors they wanted to take me away from her so my mum was was brilliant um, but for three months of the year my mum was either in hospital or in their room my, and my dad would sleep on the sofa because she would be in their room w just with the black dog shaking her by the throat when she wasn't she was the best mum in the world she was funny and she was outgoing and gregarious and uh, we used to go on adventures but so so for a lot of my there was life, no it, understanding to them was there there was none whatsoever no she suffered she she had to, i remember the blues and you got the blues she, well yeah. suffered it suffered with her nerves that was the expression that, that they used um or she wasn't at herself but i remember uh, first time I went in the police car, a policeman turned up at my primary school uh, to take me home because she'd had shock treatment and it, it had gone badly and they wanted to send her home, but they didn't want to send her to an empty house. They didn't, there were no mobile, they didn't know how to get hold of my dad, but one of the nurses knew which school I went to, so they sent the policeman, I was seven, they sent the policeman to... Uh, Jesus Christ. Took me to the hospital and I went home in the ambulance with my mum so I could look after her. But it, 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 when you're seven, it doesn't occur to you, it's just... I had, a, I had a go in a police car. I thought this is all right, Cause, and it's just I used to do all the shopping because, but, but it didn't occur to me that that was strange. It was only I was probably sort of eleven or twelve before I realised that my my upbringing was slightly different. But I didn't, it, it didn't worry me because I say when Mum was at herself, she was the best Mum ever, and and I used to love, 
I used to, I still have such fond memories of of, of Saturday night because you'd start watching the telly at six o'clock and and you'd you'd stop when Parkinson finished, you know, and in, and we used to have it was always fish and chips and I and that was great. And they, my mum and dad loved each other. They bickered like everybody else, but my dad. My dad is still, he was five foot seven, he was a proper little bantamweight, he never took a backward step, my dad, and he, people, people underestimated him, he's a very peaceful bloke, my dad, he was, if, if, if the, there was a quiet option, he would take the quiet option, but if you pushed him too far, he would stand up for himself, it's still my uncles, my Irish uncles still, first time he went over, just before they were married, he went over to Ireland in 1957, and as he said, Ireland in, then Donegal was a, it was a medieval backwater. To be perfectly honest, there was no running water. It was it was, and Dad was always very smart. Dad spent all his money on on clothes. Basically, he was very smart. He still is. Still wears a tie. Still wouldn't dream of going out without a tie. Still annoys him that I don't wear a tie on stage. He's sort of that sort of bloke. You've let the side down, haven't you? Basically, yeah. And it's like he he looks a bit because he's still got a quiff. And like my my mates always used to call him a teddy boy. It used to really annoy him because he he thought teddy boys weren't smart enough he didn't like the, the greasy hair and all that but he, he would save all his money up and he'd spend it on clothes so he said the first time he went to ireland he he deliberately went he, he bought he had took three really nice suits with him suede winkle pickers and all that and the first time he went in the pub with her brothers they were all big agricultural unit all big strong irish labouring blokes you know what i mean he, and he went in his pub and um the bar the barman wouldn't serve him the barman kept saying yeah i'll, I'll come to you in a minute and then kept serving everybody else. And he, my dad said, yeah, I've told my dad about it. His, his version is more modest, but one of my uncles said, yeah, the whole pub was laughing at this little English bloke being ignored. And after about 10 minutes, my dad wrapped uh, a coin on the bar uh, and the, the the bloke behind the bar looked at him and said, can I help you? And he said, uh, if you don't serve me next, I'm going to spark you out. Uh, and the bloke came, the bloke came from behind the bar and he, he poked, went to poke dad in my chest. And what he didn't know is that my dad had been a stoker in the Merchant Navy uh, and was strong as an ox. And my dad grabbed yeah. his finger. My dad grabbed his finger and twisted his arm around and said, you got a problem with that, mate? And the bloke just went, what can I get you? And that, <laughs> and that was it. But he was never, he was the most peaceful bloke in the world. And because, you know, he would, he would let my mum, everyone thought my mum was the boss in the relationship. I mean, she was to an extent, but he made the decision. And she, because she used to tease him, she would say, and, and it's quite true. She would say he has to walk around in the shower to get wet, you know. And, and he's got a favourite expression was he's got six hairs on his chest and three of those are loose. So, but people mis <laughs> people misjudged him. But he he but he did. Yeah. So him, we were great. We were great mates, him and I. And, and if if God forbid, sometimes I used to look forward to mum being in hospital because then we would do stuff. You know what I mean? He would take me to museums or he'd take me to. I remember going to the circus or the zoo or fairgrounds. He 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 always. Getting him to stump up money was difficult. He was always tight. He still is, but he was. We would, we would have these adventures, and and he uh, was great. He was That's just kind great. of beautiful, Kevin. It really, genuinely is. You paint such a picture. He loved. It's still my favourite memory. He was. He was. Um, I still. I adore Lauren Hardy. I've always adored Lauren Hardy. But I remember. Mm. I remember sitting on his lap. One. Well, I must have been three or four. And just roaring with laughter at Lauren Hardy. I didn't know what I was laughing at, but I was laughing because he was laughing. It's the same with Benny Hill. He loved Benny Hill, so I loved Benny Hill as well because my dad did, you know. And, and he, but he did. Um, he he was never interested in education. He left school at, at fourteen. He was never interested in, in education. His 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 mum, my nan, was a great a great reader. She loved ghost stories and. Charles Dickens and and she taught herself to play the piano, but he was never. But he taught me to read at the age of four, because he thought it would. He said it it might come in handy, so I could read before I went to primary school. <laughs> so and that's that's the thing I most I still I most thank him for that because reading was such an important part of uh, of my life. But he he just wanted all he wanted. He he said he'd be. He loved my mum. Hated what I, when I turned to showbiz and comedy. She hated it because she was she was worried for me. Do you know what I mean, but he would thought it was brilliant. I remember once, it wasn't a proper wasn't a proper job wasn't a proper job of security. And and he, I remember once, um, uh, Gary Bushell who used to write in the Sun hated me and I hated him. Uh, and I said on a lot I I said something about him on this live TV show and he and he he waited he reviewed me two weeks later, and he referred to me as a, a potato headed irrelevance which my dad thought was brilliant because I was in the sun. My mum cried for two days, but my dad thought this was 
this was brilliant. But then he stopped reading the Sun because he he, he hated what they, there was a gay comedian called Simon Fanshaw that the Sun uh, lined up against, and he 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 hated that. He was he was always um, always hated injustice. He's always been a member of the Labour Party since he, he joined the Labour Party after the coronation because he was um, he was doing his national service and he was on parade at the. Uh, the coronation and there's we still got a photograph of him in his dress uniform in the morning but when he got to the coronation his his squad uh, were put into overalls and they were cleaning latrines for the all the foreign prime minister had these portable toilet things and he, he said he remembers he remembers the, the queen going by in a gold carriage and he said i had a bucket of shit in one hand and a bucket of shit in the other hand and there's this woman going by in a gold carriage and they said i didn't think that was right he said, especially yeah. as a sergeant made him salute, even though he had a bucket of shit in his hand. So um, he's always been, he's always had this sense of injustice. He's always been one for the little man. But it's it's really interesting that how it, it, it was, he would, he would, mum, mum was far more um, hands on than he was. He was still, it was still an element of South London. Like, of course, he would hug me and, I, and I'd hug him when I was a kid. But he was, he, what I, I most admired about him. My mum always had this terrible working class attitude. It's not for the likes of us, which used to really, used to really annoy me. And he, and even you know we would we would take her to a restaurant for a birthday or for their wedding anniversary, and I and I you'd have to say to her, don't order the cheapest thing on the on the menu because that's what she would do. She'd order the cheapest thing on the menu. Whereas my dad would say, are you, are you paying for this? I'd say yes, and he would order. He'd fucking go top range, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I remember, I remember him ordering venison tartare in his posh restaurant. He would, there's nothing he wouldn't try if you offered it. I mean, but you the, said the, um, your your mum had come from extreme poverty over very in much Ireland, so, so therefore yeah. their their sense of um, that that that's scary when you don't literally know when the next meal is coming from. So the idea to go and spend hundreds of pounds on a fancy meal, yeah, it's it, just it's it, beyond them, isn't it? it? it, it it's, that's probably the case. I mean, it was it was never hundreds, Dan, but yeah, it was no, no, it's, that's a fair no, that's a that's a that's a fair point. Whereas my dad's attitude was, well, you know, if 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 it's on the if it's on the table, I'll take it. It's like my dad, yeah. my mum couldn't understand why I liked theatre and stuff. She couldn't under, she she just couldn't get it. Whereas my my dad would go. I remember, I remember saying to my, my, my Ali, my wife, who used to be a dancer a long, long time ago, she took me to see the this all-male version of, of Swan Lake, Matthew Bourne Company's all-male version of Swan Lake. And I, when I say took me to see, she dragged me kicking and screaming. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And I told my dad about it. He said, oh, I wouldn't mind seeing that. So I took my dad to see it, and he loved it. You know, he, he'll go and see. He'll try. He'll, he's always been one of those people. He'll, my mum would try nothing. My dad would try, would try everything. He's still... It, it, it's interesting he still harks back though he's, he's still he was happiest he did his national service and then he loved that so much he joined the merchant navy for three years and he he still refers to them as the as the five happiest years of his life he always says the best three weeks of his life was he had to he was in hospital um it's sort of 1965 so he was in hospital yeah. for three weeks with his finger on his foot and they they were only allowed visitors once a week, and he said it was like a carry on film. It's just him and these blokes in this ward, and he said it was brilliant. He still talks about that now, but he sounds uh, like a very curious man. He's curious about the world, and he's he's slightly curious. He's like he he still comes up with stories and theories like all people's dads do. Do you know what I mean? But he's still he led by example. You know, he was he he wasn't the sort of bloke who'd sit me down and say, right, this is how you behave. He just I copied him basically. He was just a decent, decent bloke, and it's like I could never understand when I first started going to Ireland as a kid. It used to really annoy me that they would, you know, or, or they you'd you'd go to church because I was brought up as a Catholic, and all these blokes would would get out of church as quickly as they could as soon as communion was over. They'd go to church and get pissed and you know get violent, and they would they would say my dad was godless. It's like my dad was more of a Christian than they ever were. Do you know what I mean? But he just didn't know he was being a Christian. He was just. If you needed help, he'd help you out. If if you needed advice, he'd, he you know if you needed a room for the night, he wouldn't ask you questions. He'd just give you a room for the night, he, and he, he would never sit you down and moralise that. You just I just copied the way he behaved actually. And it was always I was always more worried about letting him down than about letting anybody else down. The only the only thing I find strange now is I don't I don't resent a minute of it, but it's just no one ever told me, no one ever tells anyone that you you end up being a parent again to your own parents. No one, I, 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 no one prepared me for that. I, and looking back at it, I think I probably had a year 
before my mum died and when Ed was like 18. And if I'd known that was going to be, that's like the only year I wasn't being a parent. And then suddenly mum died. And it, it's like, I, I, I saw dad today. I'm bringing him around tomorrow to watch the Germany game. But he phoned up yesterday to say, I've just had a glass of milk. And I said, well, that's, that's nice, dad. Anything happen in and, in and around having a glass of milk? No, I just thought I'd tell you I had a glass of milk. And he's like, good boy, well done. And then, you, but, you, but then, you, you know, I went around today. You find yourself saying, did you eat yesterday? I check in the fridge to make yeah. sure that the food I put in there is actually going down. Did you sleep? Have you fed the budgies? And then, you, you know, you have to deal, you have to not get cross when he, he suddenly looked at a photograph of my mum's, dad today he said did you know that fella and of, and of course what you want to say is of course i fucking knew him. that's my granddad but you have to say yeah i met him dad that's 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 granddad he's like, oh yeah you know so those moments are few and far between but you do suddenly find yourself you know he he three years ago he's in hospital for seven weeks with this unidentified infection and suddenly he's like you're there every day looking after you and you kind of think well this when when did it happen when did he stop parenting me and i start parenting him. They become fragile, I think. That was my, I lost my dad um, seven or eight years ago now, yeah. uh, and he had uh, vascular dementia. Mm. So he's a very strong, you know, powerful man. But then he, he became like a child. And that, that thing that you said about picking up the photograph, you know, to the point where they forget phone numbers and yeah, stuff all, like that. All that. And right. it's so frustrating. It genuinely is. It's like, I've told you 50 yeah, time. but you you can't because you can't, it just. I know. I know. Well, but the, it's so yeah. The, the odd thing is, Dan, as well, that his, uh, I've his family when were, were, were really well known for their vagueness. It's like they never. Uh, my 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 nan, his mum, or I, I adored her. I'd still, she was brilliant, feisty, feisty woman. But she used to she used to tell me about dad's dad, who I never knew. Just like, she said, they all do it. They all they just drift off. They, you think they're listening, and they don't. They're just looking in the middle distance. They go somewhere else. They said they're, they're like Sergeant Wilson without the poshness. You know? And it's like, so Dad was always slightly like that. So when you say to Dad, oh, Dad, you should be able to remember these things. He said, I didn't remember it when I was 40. And you go, oh, no, fair enough, you didn't. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I know it's strange, as I know it's frustrating for him. He, he, You can see him getting cross if he can't remember a cousin's name or he can't remember where he put a certain thing that he's... You know, like a leaflet might come through the door. He wants me to have a look at, and he can't remember where it is. He gets cross about. It. But for the most part, he's, he's he's remarkable for a man of his age. But I just, he doesn't want me to be his dad. But the roles are reversing, and it's just, I I don't think either of us were prepared for it. To be perfectly honest, because he's you know he's a very proud man, like many people of his generation are. But he's been a brilliant dad to me. And he's 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 been a he's been a brilliant granddad as well. I mean, he was so. Like I said earlier, he was so hands-on when when Ed was born, and Ed Ed and he have this are they bond. pretty good friends now? Then really, really good mates. Now they're very they're very close. Um, and how does he think about him following this family trade? Oh, he loves it. He's, 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 all, he's all for it. He's very very proud. I mean, he's still very proud of what I do. Um, yeah, if he sees my name on a credit, he'll phone people up and say, you know, Kim's name. And they say, yeah, we know, we know. We, we but I know he's really, he's really proud of of Ed. Um, and and f strangely, it, 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 he's more able to tell Ed how proud he is of him than he ever was to able to tell me. Do you know what I mean? And, and he, he yeah, will, no, absolutely. He, he will tell, he will, he will tell Ed things that he he hasn't told me, which is I, I don't think that's uncommon. But it's all. But no, they've got a very, they've got a very close bond. I mean, he was very close to. Um, my mum as so my mum had kind of given up on on having grandchildren so she used to she was a brilliant woman she she adored him and by the time he came along she was her health was much improved through various medications and counseling and stuff so he never saw thank god he never saw the worst of the depression so they were they were really good mates and he he knew that if he was short of money as a kid he'd go around and sing danny boy to nanny and get a fiver so <laughs> and she she was uh, um, and it, it's strange as well because Ali's parents were um, more middle class than mine, and, and and were less hands on when it came to to being grandparents. They were less, they were more reluctant to kind of roll around with. It's like Ed, Ed went through a phase when he was two of not wanting to wear any clothes. It's like, and no one a bit like his dad, a little bit, yeah. I know where yeah. he got it from, yeah. <laughs> um, but no one turned a hair at this. But it, uh, you know, his, his other grandparents were just like, "Oh my God, he's got to put some clothes on." And my mum and dad would be going, "Why? He's only two. 
it's fine, you know, and it's, and it's always, but um, Ed used to get so excited when, in the flat where we first lived, you had to walk down past the, the window to get into the door. It's a strange arrangement. And, and if, if Ed was in the front room as a kid, he would, and he, he saw Grandad going past the window, he would go, men, gang, gang, he would get so excited. So they're still, they're still, they're still really close now, which is, which is lovely. We're quite, um, I mean, we're a small family on my dad's side, but we are, we're, we're close. And there's a massive family on my mum's side. And we're kind of not really because none of the cousins, I, I'll get on well with, seven or eight of my cousins I don't not get on with the others but we're not really in contact there's so many of them yeah but, but most of the younger ones my generation didn't want to get involved in there because it's like the League of Nations you never knew which sister was talking to which they were always falling out about something and and my Irish grand ruled the roost with a rod of iron and so sort of my generation of cousins didn't want to get involved in that living in each other's pockets so there's no yeah we're not particularly well we get on but we're not too particularly close but the small the small South London so I'm very close to my two the only two cousins I've got very close to like sisters and you know and me and Ed and, and, and my dad are a very tight tight unit and I'm, I'm I've I think you're been, really lucky I, I am lucky I've always been, sounds, it's lovely I've always been very proud of him not not because he was a brilliant fire alarm engineer he he was you know it always meant we had the loudest doorbell in South London because but apart from apart from that he was he was great at his job he loved his job but yeah I was just proud of him because he was he was my dad and he was a good dad he was always he was always there for me it was only he sounds like a proper stand-up staunch he's individual a proper, just, that's, that's exactly what and, but, and do you know what it didn't i was probably 30 before it occurred to me how difficult life must have been being married to a woman who for three months of the year was was out of the picture and it didn't it just didn't occur to me growing up it's just like that was natural and it, it's only then that i suddenly started it's only after she died that i really started to talk to him about about how he felt about it he just said well you just did it you I, I married her I loved her you did what you had to do and then you enjoyed it when she was when she was well and it's just like but it must have been so difficult for him because he wouldn't have had anyone to talk to about what it was like he wouldn't have had anyone it was to hidden away to. wouldn't it, it was totally a shame away, around no, he's, a, he's um he's he's he's, he's mischievous he's still <laughs> He's, he's got still, a glint in his eye. He still is. He's still, a, like I say, he's still to come back to. He's still a real flirt, and he's like he's having problems with this particular woman. Who he says, I don't know what she's after. I don't know where this is all going to go. And it's like, Dad, just it, we, you could just be friends. It's like because he's 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 of that generation where it, the notion of a, a man and a woman just being mates isn't it isn't there. Do you know what I mean? He's I've, like one of my best friends is a girl, and he can't even now. He'll say, Did you not even once? And say, No, Dad, she's a she's just a mate I've known her for a lot he does he does that sort of doesn't doesn't really compute but he will say things to Ali like my my she's she's stock she's a I buy her toolkits for Christmas she, she buys me candles because she's a she's a she's a techie <laughs> do you know what I mean but every now and again he'll come around that's and, a modern marriage I know you. I know isn't it just but every now and again he'll come around and, and he'll say things like you you she'll be you know doing some DIY and he'll, he'll say you need a Phillips screwdriver for that, Al. Uh, and she'll she'll look at him, and the eyebrows will go up, and she'll say, "Is a Phillips screwdriver?" I go, "All right, just check it." Or if she if she lifts something heavy, he'll say, "Do you want a hand with that?" And she'll go, "No." I'm, you know, but he does it deliberately, basically. But yeah, yeah. No, I'm very I'm I, I'm very I'm I'm lucky that we're able to be physically close. I'm lucky that he's close enough for me to be able to see him. And it's a it, it's a constant worry though. I worry about him the way I worry about Ed when he was a toddler. There's never. There's never a moment when I, every time the phone rings, my my your your heart kind of palpitates. Is there, um, you know what I mean? Just because obviously the, the eight um, we got sort of uh, on a player song before we wrap up, yeah. but is there still a community there? Because London has changed so so much. Is does he still have pals within the community, or have they all? His, his sold up and disappeared yeah no it's all it, it was funny it was always there was always quite a big turnover in london anyway it's, it's, you had a, a lot of all the houses in my road were, were flats and most of them have been turned back into houses now unfortunately he rents his he's been renting it since 1956 but if if he owned the house we'd all be laughing but th th most of them are now because it there's been an e element of gentrification so now he gets on well with the neighbors but there was never no there's no th th our community was always the local irish community we'd go to irish pubs and, and irish dances and that oh, sort okay, of thing yeah. which he liked he loves ireland but 
um, his his power. He lost his two powers. He had two powers from work. His, um, Del Taylor was his closest mate, and Del Taylor was a proper South London wide boy troublemaker. He'd retired to Cornwall, hated every minute of it. But it, Dad and Del would speak on the phone for two or three hours a day, basically. So he's he's lost most of his powers. But he's he's got a a different community now. There's like I say, there's this group of women in the street that he's close. He's more sociable than he used to be. He used to be quite happy in his own company, but no, there's no yeah. real sense of community. He, he loves he loves my mates. He likes going out, or used to, when we could still go out. He used to love coming out to the pub with my mates. Um, yeah. And, you know, telling the same stories, which is which is all fine, you know, because yeah. he, he was always good for another story, and, and most of his stories are quite good. There's, there's one particular story about a Zulu, a Zulu brothel that gets longer with each <laughs> telling... Which of course he couldn't tell. I know he still waxes lyrical about this, the, the shrimp curry and the Zulu brothel, which he swears is the only reason he ended up in there, and he didn't know it was a brothel. But yeah, you can't a, wait to see that on TripAdvisor. No, I know <laughs> exactly. I know, but no, I'm very. Um, I, I'm. I, I am very proud of him. He's. He's. He's a. He's been. A, he's been a. Was and continues to be a really good dad. So I've been. I've been lucky in that element. So if we were going to play him a song, as a as a thank you to it's Kenny, isn't it? Kenny, yeah, yeah. So if we're going to play a, a song that for Kenny that reminds you of Kenny, what that might be before we uh... well, probably what do you think? I should, what what I, what I should tell you about that is my dad was um, he was a twin, and his his twin died in in childbirth, but he's always had he's always thought that his twin has grown up with him which was a kind of comfort to him, which is, is an odd sort of way. And my uncle, he used to work a long time ago. My uncle Bill used to work with him. He was married to dad's sister. And uncle Bill was one of those proper, uh, bolshy little self-taught blokes who knew something about everything. I really liked uncle Bill. He was brilliant. Uh, he, he claimed that his cousin was the craze uh, reserve uh, getaway driver, which I don't know why the craze would want a reserve getaway driver. But anyway, he's that sort of bloke. But he was a spiritualist and he... He 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 once said my dad was up a ladder and he said Bill can you would you would you put your foot on the ladder he said no there's no need your, your twin brother's on the got his foot on the ladder you know um, and my dad believed because there were several times he was in several accidents that he shouldn't have come out of and he 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 always believed that his brother that was his only he's never religious but he he believed that his brother was growing up with him which is an odd thing but um, that was by the by I should have said that because it kind of explains things about it and my dad uh, I I hate country music. Country Western music is the music of the devil, as far as I'm concerned. Because my mum used to listen to the Irish version of it. It's called show band music, and it's 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 just awful. I, it, I, I'm going pale at the thought of it. But <clears throat> my dad used to try all sorts. Del used to send it. Dad, like, I, I remember him playing. He put this Japanese record on once. It's like, and he thought it was brilliant. He he bought me the 1812 overture because I was going to grammar school. He thought I should listen to classical music, but he loved. He, there was one exception I would make to, to country and western music, and that is Johnny Cash. His, my dad loved Johnny Cash. He still loves Johnny Cash to this day. I I, I don't have to phone him up to find out whether he's in, because halfway down the road I'll hear Johnny Cash blaring out. Of his, how wonderful! Uh, yeah, just he, genuinely, how wonderful! Yeah, he he loves Johnny. As a walk the line was his. He but he he just had. He loves he loves cowboy films. He adores cowboy films. Because he, he, he's he's got his telly, he's got his free view. There's there's never a moment when there's not a cowboy film, and he's seen them all. But he will sit and watch them again. He he just loves cowboy films. But Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash is his, he he just adores Johnny Cash. So it, it it when he when he when he goes, he's already said that at, at you know at his funeral, God forbid, he he wants he wants a Johnny Cash song played. So and Walter Line is the Johnny Cash song that he Has he to loves be, the most. It, really? so, yeah. Okay. Well, what we'll do, we'll have a little listen to it now. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine I keep my eyes wide open all the time I keep the ends out for the tie that binds Because you're mine 
I walk the line I find it very, very easy to be true I find myself alone when each day is through Yes, I'll admit that I'm a fool for you Because you're mine, I walk the line As sure as night is dark and day is light I keep you on my mind both day and night And happiness I've known proves that it's right Because you're mine, I walk the line Try to turn the tide Because you're mine I walk the line I keep a close watch On this heart of mine I keep my eyes Wide open all the time I keep the ends out for the tie that binds Because you're mine, I walk the line Because you're mine, I walk the line Because you're mine, I walk the line Kevin, it's yes. been wonderful. Genuinely, well, I could talk to you all night. I genuinely could. Um, your 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 tales are brilliant, and I thank you for being so honest and so open um, as well. Because you said there is a natural side to you that is the the performer. Yeah, but I think there's a, a genuinely decent human being there as well. Which is really nice to actually talk to. I'll take that as a compliment. I might, I might, I'll put that on my next Edinburgh poster. A genuinely <laughs> decent human being, Dan Flanagan. No, it's yeah, not. It's, it's kind of well. You kind of. It's you know. Thank you. You. I, I do like the sound of my own voice. I do like talking about myself. I'm not going to lie. Um, I like being the centre of attention. But you also you can only respond to um, questions that are put to you basically. So you 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 create a space for me to be able to to talk to. So and also I you know I. I I very rarely get the opportunity to tell people about my dad, and it's 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 a pleasure for me. I'm more interested in telling people about my dad than about I've I've, I've never really worried. I've never it's never I've never thought to myself, am, am I a good dad? Have I been a good dad? Because I, I hope I have, and I think I have. But um, I just I'm more concerned with telling people that my dad was a good dad. You know what I mean? Because we all we all have to. Um, it's like that, that. You as you know, just before or just after I spoke to you last time, I was going down to Brighton, so I co-wrote this show with Arthur Smith about his dad, Sid, who was a prisoner of war. And it's just like, Sid was the most amazing man, but he was an, an ordinary bloke in extraordinary circumstances. And I think all our all our parents are really. And it's just, it's just one of the things I love most about doing that show about Arthur's dad, Sid, is that you just had to factor in, in Edinburgh when we did it, you had to factor in that for an hour after each show, people in the audience would want to come up and tell us about their their dads and and all you can do is listen because it's important and we don't get a chance to share our, our love for it our is, parents a lot of the time you know most of I think the, there's you know, um 
Yeah, there's also the thing though. For so many years, we are so self-centered. Yeah. Our parents are there to fetch and carry and wipe our yeah. asses. Yeah, yeah. We do not see that they are human beings with a story, with a past, yeah. with likes and distance and fears and worries. We take that for granted because they are there to serve us. Yeah. And it's only when you get older and you start having a few battle scars yourself. And the, Jesus, that that was hard for me. Yeah. God knows how you coped it without you know any support network or simply being able to have a conversation and say that stuff out loud yeah you know yeah well he couldn't I mean he, he couldn't even have that conversation with my mum they wouldn't that generation wouldn't so you, you're absolutely right so but thank you so much for your not at time all. it's pleasure. been a, a pleasure and a privilege if people want to follow you find out a little bit more just give us your Twitter handles my Twitter handle is at Kevin Hunter Day um, uh, hopefully at the end of this year I'll be, I'll be doing some live stuff again but in the meantime if you want to listen to The Price of Football, um, the surprisingly successful podcast about the finances of football, then then please do. But um, I've, I, And if, if anybody here wants to get in touch with me via you and ask any other questions, I'm, a, I'm p- perfectly happy for that to happen as well. So, You're a scholar and a gentleman. All right, right mate. Tonight, for- Kevin Day, this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm Just Like My Father is a dadless old production. Concept, content and conversation by Dan Flanagan in the UK. Editing and post-production by Dermot McGrath in Canada. This series is supported and funded by Commit to Culture, the Creative Commons project sponsored by Ada and Worthing Trust. For more information, Dadla Soul is a revolutionary grassroots movement that uses art, music and technology to battle social isolation and loneliness suffered by millions of dads across the UK every day. To find out more, just visit www.dadlasoul.com.